In part one of this two-part flash battle, we began our conversation about speed lights and monolights and looked at how they both produce a different shape of light. Now it's time to get a little bit technical. Stay tuned. Hey gang, so here we are, the third video in my speed light series and part two of the comparison between speed lights and monolights. I promised you that this video would be about the tech stuff. Now for those of you that are really anxious for me to get into the how-to stuff, stay tuned until the end and I'll show you a quick behind the scenes look at an outdoor speed light shot that I did a little while back, just to keep your appetite satisfied until we're done with all this tech talk. So in part one of the speed lights versus monolights flash battle, I gave you a generalization of the tech comparison. This time we're gonna dig a little deeper and talk about the two things that I think are most important for you to consider before making your purchase. This is the one category where there is a clear cut winner. Monolights are routinely much more powerful than speed lights because they're larger and they're able to generate and use more power. The challenge is that it is very difficult to compare them accurately. The reason for that is that speed light manufacturers use a method of comparison called guide number, which tells you very little about the actual power of your flash. And monolight manufacturers use watt seconds for comparison. Guide number measures the light that is reaching your subject, and watt seconds measures the power that the unit is able to deliver to the flash tube. Two completely different measurements, but that's just the beginning of the difficulty. So let's start with guide numbers. The way to calculate a flash's guide number is to multiply the distance times the f-stop. This of course is based on a manual setting at full power and an ISO of 100. Here's an example. If your flash is 10 feet from your subject and you need an aperture of f8 to get a properly exposed image, the flash's guide number is 80. Pretty simple, right? If you're using the same flash at 20 feet, the guide number will still be 80, but your exposure will change to f8. Four. By the way, understanding that calculation can help you very accurately set your starting exposure with manual flashes so that your initial test shots are pretty darn close to proper exposure. If you walk into a room and set that flash 10 feet from the subject, you already know your aperture is f8 at ISO 100. Now the problem with guide numbers is that a lot of manufacturers measure their guide number with a flash zoomed out to its tightest angle of view which indeed does measure the most amount of light that the flash can create. But in practice, you probably won't use your flash nearly as much zoomed in as you will zoomed out. And since the different strobes zoom to different lens equivalents, you wind up trying to compare apples to apples to apples. So always dig deep to find out what values the speed light manufacturer is using to determine guide number. You want to know the ISO they used, as well as the power setting of the zoom, and then of course, the aperture and the distance from the flash to the subject. Monolight manufacturers don't make it any easier to compare. Monolights and studio strobes are compared by a metric called watt seconds. This number is even more unreliable because the measurement of watt seconds is simply how much energy the flash stores and makes available to the capacitor to power the flash tube. It's an unreliable number because different flash tubes have different energy efficiencies as do different reflectors. So understand that when you look at a 150 watt second monolight compared to a 300 watt second or a 500 watt second, indeed each one is a little more powerful than the other. But from one brand to the next, it doesn't mean that they give you exactly the same output. So my advice for choosing a monolight brand is to go for the features that you want and then choose the appropriate watt seconds within that brand for your needs. And don't worry if another brand is gonna be a little more or a little less powerful. Short of trying them out, it's very difficult to compare. What I can tell you with confidence is that the bigger speed lights on the market today come in around 55 to 60 watt seconds of power. Most monolights are available in power from 150 watt seconds on up to well over 1,000 watt seconds. So indeed, Monolights are considerably more powerful than speed lights. Remember in the last video, the comparison portrait that I showed you between a speed light and a monolight? The image on the left is the 150 watt second monolight shot at f8. And the image on the right is the LumaPro 180R with a guide number of 80 shot at 5.6. Both photos are at ISO 100. 
Both strobes are at full power and the same distance from the subject. And the difference in exposure is because the monolight is more powerful. Hopefully you didn't miss that part about F8 with a 150 watt second monolight for a portrait. I wanted to point that out because if you're shooting portraits and don't need to light a large arena like a basketball court, you don't need a 500 and 1000 watt second monolight. You'll just be throwing money away. In my opinion, this is the second most important factor for most people in deciding to go with a speed light or monolight. The recycling time of your flash is directly impacted by how much power you use. If you're shooting at 1 8th power, the flash will generally recycle faster than it will at full power. So for the sake of comparing, we're going to talk about recycling times at full power. For speed lights, recycling times with AA batteries can vary from 2.5 to 5 seconds depending on the brand of flash. If you're using high power rechargeables or lithium ion batteries on some of the newer speed lights, you can get your recycling times down to as little as one to one and a half seconds. Some flashes like the Luma Pro 180R will recycle as fast as one second if you use a high voltage external battery pack like this Godox PB820. With monolights, depending on the brand, you can get recycling times as low as two tenths of a second with a high end Profoto monolight or still a very fast one second recycling time on a $99 Flashpoint 320M which is a 150 watt second strobe. Now this is where we have to talk about the practical side of recycling times. First, do you really need the flash to recycle in two tenths of a second or one second? While some of you will, most people don't. But when you're looking at purchasing a flash, if recycling time is important to you, you also have to have a look at how many shots can you fire in a row at peak recycling before the flash overheats and either slows down or shuts down until it's cooled off. This is a definite consideration with most speed lights simply because they're not fan cooled. So some brands will just stop firing when they reach a certain temperature or others like the LumaPro will keep firing but they slow down the recycle time to prevent the flash from overheating. And with mono lights, less expensive ones like the Flashpoint 320M, they'll let you get five to eight full power flashes in rapid succession before the flash trips a circuit that stops the flash from firing until you turn it off, let it cool down, and turn it back on again. As I've mentioned before, the 320M sells for $99.95, very affordable. But you can get a comparable unit by Paul C. Buff, the Alien B B400, which is a 160 watt second flash with a 0.5 second recycle time at full power, and it will not cut off after multiple flashes. The B400 sells for $224.95, and it's a little smaller and a little lighter in size than the Flashpoint. The additional speed and features will cost you more than double the price. Totally worth it if you need those features. A waste of money if you don't. So you can see why it's very difficult to compare flash units directly. As I mentioned last week, speed lights are definitely smaller and more portable, but most monolight brands now have models with the ability to work off a portable battery pack so you can take them on location if you don't mind the size and the weight. This is where the camera's light meter is allowed to control the flash to provide the correct amount of light for whatever ISO and aperture you've selected. TTL is particularly great for run and gun shooting at events and weddings where the lighting conditions can change rapidly. Now I know that some of you will be disappointed and I'm sorry but I'm not going to do a deep dive into TTL strobes. Full disclosure, for portraits and the kind of work that I do, I'm not a fan of it and I don't use it. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't, I just prefer manual control, in part because it forces me to constantly pay attention to my light and any changes that take place. I do own a Flashpoint TTL speed light for those rare occasions that I need an on-camera flash for events or just to get some quick shots of my grandson. But that's it. I picked the Flashpoint because of its price and the fact that it has a lithium ion battery. Yep, just one battery instead of four. TTL flashes do of course cost more than manual strobes and companies like Godox and Profoto offer TTL monolights if you're willing to shell out the cash. Be sure to do your research as some TTL strobes require a specialized degree to understand their menu settings. I'm not kidding. It's not exactly what I would call user friendly. And research is the key and the moral to my story. Just asking somebody which flash is right for you 
is asking to waste your money. Do your research. Begin here on YouTube. You can find great reviews for just about every flash made. Search for that flash brand on Facebook and you'll probably find a Facebook group dedicated to users of that brand. This can be a great way to get direct access to people who really love that brand of flash and know it inside and out. And as I mentioned early on, remember that there is no one size fits all flash unit. Most photographers begin with speed lights and for many, that's all they'll ever need. Others reach a point where they need power and speed and then they make the step up to mono lights. But generally, don't get rid of all their speed lights. Now I promised you a quick behind the scenes look from a speed light shot that I did on location a little while back. When I'm shooting a modeling portfolio, I frequently do shots at a local college campus since it has a great selection of different architecture and it also has lots of shade almost any time of the day. The entrance to the school's athletic center has these really cool pillars placed in a half circle. At midday, there is also a nice pattern of light that forms as the sunlight begins to work its way through the pillars. For this shot, I placed a Nikon SB900 flash on a stand and aimed it through a white umbrella. The flash is set just outside the pillars so that it would mimic daylight and allow me to get just enough pop on my subject to make her stand out against the bricks. Now if you look close in this shot, you can see a cord running from my camera to a Nikon commander unit that is just behind the pillar. The Nikon creative lighting system flashes work with a dedicated optical signal, so they need to be able to see each other. This is also why I no longer use the Nikon flashes. I would strongly recommend using radio triggers. That way you can even have a flash in the next room and still fire it. So hopefully you're feeling better prepared to make a choice between speed lights or monolights for your needs and not as overwhelmed by all the numbers and the features that get talked about. So until next time, remember that your best shot, it's your next shot. So keep learning, keep thinking, and keep shooting. Adios. Thanks for watching. If you find these videos helpful, please give them a thumbs up and share them with your photography friends. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss a single episode. And if you have a question that you would like answered, post it in the comments section below. Your question could be my next video.